Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today, a production of the University of the District of Columbia. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today, we'll be talking about hate crimes on campus, gay students, and nonviolence. Arun Gandhi is president of the Gandhi Worldwide Education Institute. Born in Durban, South Africa, Arun is author of World Without Violence, Can Gandhi's Vision Become Reality? Arun's grandfather, Mahatma Gandhi, was one of the most important leaders of the 20th century. Through daily lessons with his grandfather, Arun studied both violence and anger. Winnie Stackelberg is senior vice president for external affairs at the Center for American Progress. Winnie served as political director of the Human Rights Campaign, the largest gay civil rights organization in the United States. She co-authored an article about the Local Law Enforcement Hate Crimes Prevention Act, which was later signed into law by President Obama. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks again for coming on. It's a pleasure. You're welcome. Arun, if I can start with you, if, if you wouldn't mind saying a word or two about what nonviolence is uh, and what that means in our contemporary political context. Well, I think nonviolence needs to be understood by first understanding what we mean by violence. I found that generally people think of violence only in the physical terms, all the fighting and the killings and the wars and things that happen uh, in our societies and world today. But uh, violence occurs in many other forms also. And I learned this from my grandfather when he made me draw a family tree, a genealogical tree of violence, with violence as the grandparent and physical violence and passive violence are the two branches. And every day before I went to bed, I had to analyze and examine everything that I had experienced during the day and put them down on that, on that tree in their appropriate places. Now, physical violence is something we understand and we recognize because it's, it hurts. It's all the fighting, beating, killing, rape, murders, all of these things where we use physical force against people. But the repassive violence is something that we tend to ignore and not even recognize. And that is things like prejudice, discrimination, oppression, looking down on people, teasing, name calling, and hundreds and hundreds of things, exploitation, and all of these things that we do to people without using any physical violence. Sometimes we don't even see the people, and yet we hurt people somewhere by our actions or our inactions. And when I did this exercise and introspection, I was able to fill up a whole wall in my room with acts of passive violence. And that is when my grandfather explained to me the connection between the two. He said, we commit passive violence all the time, every day, consciously and unconsciously, and that generates anger in the victim, and the victim then resorts to physical violence to get justice. So it is passive violence that fuels the fire of physical violence. So logically, if we want to put out that fire of physical violence, we have to cut off the fuel supply, and since the fuel supply comes from each one of us, we have to become the change we wish to see in the world. Fair enough. And Winnie, would, would you think, would you agree with Arun that anti-gay violence is both passive and physical? I would absolutely uh, agree with Arun on, on that point, um, that violence against the gay and lesbian community, transgender community, is, is both physical, um, where there are uh, acts of brutality against uh, gay men, lesbians, um, transgender people all the time. But there is also an insipid um, passive violence, mm -hmm. as Arun calls it, uh, that is discriminatory, that is about speech, that is about actions. And, and I would agree that it's, it's that kind of internalized anger and hostility towards another that is almost as dangerous, if not more so, um, not only to the individual, but to our broader society. And I know that you've been involved in, obviously, gay and lesbian issues for a really long time. How would you connect some of the work that you've done here in Washington in terms of the legislative work to fighting some of the passive uh, violence that we're talking about? Well, I think one of the most important things to do um, in this context, whether it's violence um, against the LGBT community or others, is to draw attention to it. I mean, I think one of the things that is it, is, it is not helpful if that kind of violence, that kind of treatment of other people 
is, is not um, talked about, is not discussed, if differences aren't addressed. It's not to say that we all have to end the conversation agreeing, but we all have to at least start the conversation. And so my, my work in the legislative sphere um, in Congress um, well over a decade ago to actually pass a hate crimes bill began um, in the wake of several high profile hate crimes, one against an African American, James Byrd in Jasper, Texas, and one against a gay man, uh, Matthew Shepard in um, Laramie, Wyoming. And that kind of work, drawing attention to what had happened to these two people, the anger, the animosity, the hatred of the other, um, was, was a project, was a life's work that was meant to draw attention not to only to the work in Washington to pass a piece of legislation that was ultimately signed into law, but really to ensure that communities all across this country uh, knew about this kind of violence and, and started to stop it. Well, how can we do more? I mean, and that, that doesn't mean that the work that your grandfather did and the work that you do isn't important and the work that you've been doing isn't important, but clearly there's still a lot of violence in society, passive and uh, physical. What can we do um, in the education arena to make sure that people hate people less? Maybe I can throw that to both of you. Well, I personally feel that we need to educate because, you know, all of this discrimination and prejudices that exist in human beings, it's out of ignorance. And uh, we need to dispel that ignorance. And ignorance cannot be dispelled by law alone. It has to be through education, through reaching out to making people understand. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in one year or two years either. It's going to take a long time to get away with these prejudices. One of the reasons why we find even in the uh, discrimination of the African American community in this country has not really achieved the goal in spite of the laws and, uh, and the civil rights and all of that is because we have ignored the educational factor. We have just looked at the legal factor, laws, enact the laws and everything will take care of itself and it doesn't. You have to educate, you have to make people understand and break down their prejudices. No law can break down prejudices that exist in the minds of human beings. So that can come only through education, through persistence and uh, awareness and so on. Um, I, I, I agree with that completely. And one of the, it's interesting, one of the components of the um, hate crimes law that President Obama um, signed in uh, late 2009 was was a component about education mm -hmm. um, and not just education in schools but education of community leaders education of uh, police departments and of law enforcement officials because often they are the first to witness right. what has happened in the crime and it's terribly important for our local law enforcement officials in particular who were asking for this piece of legislation to get the kind of training they need to help um, take care of the immediate si situation, but then work in communities, communities that they live in, work in those communities to, uh, to address the violence um, so that it doesn't start in the beginning. Well, you mentioned the issue of local law enforcement. If I'm not mistaken, recently there was a, uh, a, an alleged hate crime uh, in Washington where a, uh, a, a, a number of lesbian uh, young people claimed that the police wouldn't take their report on the grounds that it wasn't really a hate crime. Am I misreading that? No, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think there is, when, when the, the debate around the hate crimes legislation was, was most intense, there were definitely some people who said there is no such thing as a hate crime. There are crimes. There are certainly violence against other people, and that's wrong. But there's nothing about a hate crime, because those are thoughts. But I think we're not trying to um, legislate or criminalize what people think but just the violence that's committed against others. And I think the example of the lesbians here in the District of Columbia is a perfect example of when law enforcement themselves are not seen as an ally in combating this kind of discrimination, but are part of, of the problem. And that's the kind of, um, of education that needs to be addressed in law enforcement communities all across this country. And I think it, you know, it also, if you look back at the, um, the segregation of the racial issues with the African American. At that time of the height of discrimination before 1964, the police ignored uh, any complaints that were made by African Americans. They didn't consider them to be crime or, or anything. And so, you know, it's the same kind of history is repeating itself. So these are all 
prejudices that we need to deal with through understanding and education. And, and uh, my, one of my uh, greatest criticism with the educational institutions is that we have emphasized careers so much that we have mm, ignored the human factor in education altogether. We don't teach people about uh, relationships, about understanding different cultures and different religions. All that is left uh, to, to them to find out for themselves. We only emphasize careers. We want to give the kids a career that they can use and exploit and go out and make money. And that's not the purpose of education alone. But let's take your, your issue of, of careers and education a little further. And since you both are bringing the issue of the police into this, um, and Arun, if you don't mind me bringing some of South African history into this as well, mm -hmm. um, there's a long history of the police uh, being not helpful, but there's also a, a long history of the police being helpful. Yes. And so how do we make sure that the police are on the right side? Um, my dealings with the police have generally been positive. Uh, you know, I know a lot of police officers, and they generally are very helpful people, in, mm -hmm. at least as I found as a person. But, but you're right. I mean, if you think about some of the problems that happened all the way back to, you know, the, you know, the police in Peter Maritzburg that affected your grandfather, you know, right. you know, 100 years ago, well over 100 years ago now, um, clearly this is a problem. So how do we bring education not just to a classroom, but how do we bring education about passive and, and, and act of violence to police departments in the United States, in South Africa, in India. How do we do that? Well, I was gonna just say that, that here at least, I think there is a fair amount of training of police departments that, that goes on. It's not enough, um, but it's that kind of um, connection and, and communication among police departments and community members that's so terribly important. And it's not to say that, that uh, the police are any more, um, are any more ignorant than others, but it's, it's, it's giving them the tools to do their jobs better. And there are a number of programs um, here in the district and in other rural and urban and suburban communities around this country funded through the federal government often um, that seeks to do that, bring community leaders, individuals, and um, law enforcement together to better understand each other, to avoid these problems in the first instance. And so you see a lot of um, sort of uh, police officers now um, patrolling communities um, whereas they used to drive around in cars, and it's about getting to know people much better so that we're more aware of our differences um, than before. Yes, I agree with that, and I also feel that uh, we have to remember that the police and the politicians and everybody, they come out of society. They bring into their work all the prejudices and baggage that they carry from society there. And if they are not helped to deal with these issues uh, early enough, then you see it reflected in their work. You know, just as we are talking about the police uh, bringing discrimination into their workplace. It's all because of that ignorance and uh, we have not done enough over the years to break down that ignorance and, uh, and make them aware of, um, you know, relationships. You know, and, and I, just to pick up on that, I think that is, that is one of the challenges that faces um, uh, educators today. Um, from, from elementary school to middle school to high school mm -hmm. uh, to higher education. Uh, how can you, in, in a world that is so fast, where educators are focused on careers, where um, we have every kind of gadget and technology to communicate to each other, but we're not doing it as human being to human being, we're doing it as personal device to personal device. How can we sort of move those aside and sit down um, and look at each other face to face and address those differences? Because I think, as we said before, it, it's not that the differences are gonna go away, and it's not as if um, ignorance and anger are, are gonna suddenly melt away from human beings. We are who we are, but we just have to better uh, understand how to deal with those differences. And sort of here we are on the eve of the 10th anniversary of September 11th, um, which was a horrific event, um, but was an event that brought us closer together or further divided us. And I think that's a big lesson that we, we haven't yet figured out what the answer to that is because if it further divides us, if we become more angry at each mm -hmm. other, if there are more opportunities for violence, um, if, we, if we continue to sort of build, um, build walls amongst each other, um, we're, we're, we're destined to, to repeat um, some of the anger and animosity that came after those, those days. But, but let's, take it, let's take it the other way. Let's say someone here on the show today was uh, a representative of the military 
right? And their job is to defend the United States. And, and let's assume that many of those troops are, are angry that their country, our country, was attacked. What should they do? Well, I would say that, you know, we uh, picking up on the anger issue again, and uh, you brought it up with the military. Uh, I think we ignore this very powerful emotion totally. We don't teach people how to deal with anger or how to recognize anger and how to use it effectively. We just allow every individual to find their own ways of dealing with this. And the result is that all of us end up abusing anger. Now, I was very angry when I was growing up in South Africa because of the prejudices and, and all the humiliation that I had to experience there. And I was taught by my grandfather that anger is like electricity. It's just as useful and just as powerful, but only if we use it intelligently. But it can be just as deadly and destructive if we abuse it. So just as we channel electrical energy and bring it into our lives and use it positively, we must learn to use anger in the same way so that we can use that energy positively for the good of humanity rather than abuse it. So this is a message that needs to be taught to everybody from childhood so that they learn how to deal with anger. What, we hap what happened in 9-11, for instance, was uh, an angry response to uh, what happened. And we declared a war and, and uh, now we are stuck in two wars and we don't know how to get out of it after 10 years. Now I have a, a, an example of the similar thing that happened in India in 1919 when uh, there was a meeting in the state of Punjab in North India where 10,000 men, women and children assembled to listen to my grandfather's emissary come to explain to them what, what nonviolence was about. And the governor of the state, uh, General Dyer, a Britisher, he decided that this was a defiance of the British authority and he was not going to allow it to happen. He brought the troops there and surrounded the people and shot into the crowd and killed within minutes 386 men, women and children and injured about 1,800 and some odd uh, severely. And then he uh, told the people that they are not to attend to the injured people for the next 72 hours. And later on in the inquiry commission, he told the people that the reason they stopped firing was because they ran out of ammunition. But he said if he had more ammunition, he would have killed more people. Now that incident created so much anger in, this, in, in the country, just as the 9-11 created in this country. But my grandfather realized that if somebody let a spark ignite the uh, anger there, the British could have been wiped out because at that time in 1919, the British were outnumbered 4,000 to one. But he said that we have to recognize that the British need to be liberated as much as we need to be liberated from them. And so he channeled the anger of the Indian people into nonviolent action and he said, let's join together and liberate the British from their imperialism and liberate ourselves from their colonialism. And so he was able to channel that energy into positive action. I thought of that on 9-11 when it happened, and I wrote about it. And I said, I hope that the president will channel the anger of the American people to reflect on why did this happen? And what can we do to improve our relationships with that part of the world so that we don't have to suffer this kind of thing again? But that article wasn't uh, published because nobody was interested in that kind of uh, uh, attitude. Everybody was so angry they was wanted eye for an eye revenge. And like my grandfather said, eye for an eye only makes the whole world blind. Well, if, if I'm not mistaken from studying a little bit about your grandfather, that was the site uh, that your grandfather led the salt march to that very site, if I'm not mistaken. No, no. It was the a, salt it was a, march was different. It, the salt march was to another place where there was another massacre where there were a lot of yeah, people killed. Right. Uh, and that was to Dandi, uh, the village of Dandi, and they made, 
you know, what, uh, what was happening was the British were taking the Indian salt, refining it in Britain, packaging it, and bringing it back, like they did with everything else, all the raw material. And uh, so they were selling it to the Indian uh, consumer for uh, four, five, six times the price, and they couldn't afford it. So grandfather said, this is nonsense. This is our salt, and we are going to make it and consume it. Uh, he defied the British law. But it was such an insignificant kind of thing that even the British and many of the Indian leaders, they laughed at him and he says, you're going to bring down the British Empire by defying the salt law? He says, what kind of act is that? But he had the pulse of the nation. When he started this movement with 79 people, the, the march, 21 days later, he ended with millions of people following him. And the whole country erupted. And that surprised the British and caught them unawares. And they couldn't do anything about it. But how can we take some of the, this example of, and I realize India is a different country, and that was a different time period. But I, just, I still think that the argument you're making is a powerful one. How can we take the issue of being nonviolent and then helping our students and professors to be more sensitive to violence towards the gay and lesbian community and towards other communities generally. How can we do that as a society? Well, it has to be a comprehensive thing. You know, it's not, uh, not one thing that is going to help there. And we have to realize when I talk about nonviolence and when my grandfather talked about nonviolence, he uh, did say that we can create a totally nonviolent society. But that should be our goal, to create that society, whether we achieve it or not. To put it in context, it's like a student going to the university, and that student aspires to get an A-plus grade in every subject that uh, he or she uh, studies. But not everybody reaches that A-plus grade, but they aim for that. So in the same way, we have to aim for a totally nonviolent society. Even if we don't achieve it, we will be somewhere closer to a nonviolent society. So we have to do that and, and uh, accept the fact that in some situations, some violence may be necessary, but we ought to be able to create uh, a society where the minimum violence is used, not the maximum violence. And that is achievable. It's not a, a pipe dream. It is achievable if we make that effort to achieve it. The other thing I would say is that I think many of, um, of the efforts to, to reduce bullying on campuses, to provide safer environments, um, educational environments at, at all levels of, of schooling, um, aren't about a um, one-size approach, even if it right. all is a, it, it contains the theme of nonviolence. I think it's a mistake to say there's one approach for stopping bullying in schools, that there's one approach to the LGBT community um, to make us safe. Th that's not true. It has to be um, organic, and it, it has, has to, to be, be very uh -huh. specific to each community. So you see local school districts coming up with lots of different kinds of approaches to address bullying on campus. You see lots of um, gay straight alliances, GSAs, cropping up in hundreds and hundreds of schools around this country, whether they're in urban neighborhoods or in rural or suburban neighborhoods, to, to address this. But it's not, there isn't one approach. Now, I think the federal government, um, the president can help. Um, and I think calling attention to these issues absolutely helps. There's a campaign called It Gets Better. And there have been videos, and the, the president and, and the first lady have done one, and the secretary of education, Arnie Duncan, has one, and school mm -hmm. district leaders around the country have. Um, many of our sports teams have put together an It Gets Better video. And so having um, people who we look up to talk about these issues um, is very, very important. But I don't think we can prescribe one way to solve them, because no. they, they bubble up in different ways and unique ways. In yeah, communities. it has to be tackled at different levels, you know, all right from the home to the school, to the college, to sports to the figures, and like you say, all the people who make an impact. Everybody has to be a part of this whole thing. And again, it also boils down to relationships. You know, mm -hmm. Ultimately, you see all the bullying that takes place and, and things that happen in school. It's about bad relationships. Our relationships today are so uh, selfishly motivated. We are always thinking of what am I going to gain from 
this relationship and if I don't gain anything, why should I bother to? And that is a very negative way of building relationships, which is what we are doing right now. But relationships ideally should be based on the four principles of respect, understanding, acceptance, and appreciation. If we respect ourselves and respect each other, we will understand who we are and why we are here on earth. And then we will be able to accept each other as human beings and not discriminate against people because of their color or their gender or their uh, uh, sexual um, uh, you know, choices and, and all of these things. And then we will appreciate our own humanity. So that whole aspect of building relationships is also part of the education program. And it has to be inculcated in the child right from their homes. The parents have to show this respect for the child and there should be a, you know, that kind of respectful relationship. So it, uh, you know, it means the whole, uh, whole society has to get involved in changing this whole attitude. Um, I agree with that, and I certainly agree that, that so much of, of the, the, the teaching and the education and learning from each other comes from home. Right. comes from the example yeah. that we set as parents yeah. um, mm -hmm. and that we set for our children. I know um, that, that one of the, um, one of the uh, approaches of the LGBT community is, is about coming out, is about being open exactly. and honest mm -hmm. about one's sexual orientation and gender identity. And that's a very powerful tool. You don't hide who you are. Mm -hmm. um, and so you wander about the campus of your kid's school and you happen to be a lesbian or you happen to be um, someone who's disabled or you happen to be someone who's African American or looks different or is from a different country. And we talk about those differences. I think one of the most powerful tools that the um, gay and lesbian and transgender community um, has given to movement building mm. um, and, and to the march toward progress and equality is, is about coming out and being open and honest about who we are. Um, because then you can address your differences. I mean, people may still discriminate. People right. may still um, say bad things about us. But I think you've got to be open and honest about who you are because then you'll, uh, if you don't, you'll never be able to confront um, the, the prejudice exactly. that we're all born exactly. with. Exactly. Well, we're going to have to leave it at that. Thank you both for those very um, heartfelt and insightful comments um, for today and for our viewers. If you would like additional information, about the Gandhi Worldwide Education Institute or the Center for American Progress, please visit GandhiForChildren.org or AmericanProgress.org. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.